thank you for the Dan and uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my session this afternoon is going to deal with the religious dimension that Brother John mentioned in his previous address. Remember that quotation from Joel chapter 3, proclaim a holy war? Well we're going to see in this afternoon's session why there is this dramatic religious holy dimension to this invasion. It's not just the invasion of Russia of the Middle East, dramatic and powerful though that is. There is sitting behind the scenes this tremendous evil force known as the papacy. And this afternoon we're going to look at a number of quotations that demonstrate why we understand this to be so. To look at the scriptures of truth, the foundation scriptures that teach us the awfulness of this system and the power that will be demonstrated in this invasion. So we're going to talk about four key points in our address. The first one is this, that the papacy itself will continue to flourish in luxury, in power, in blasphemy, in mystery, in immorality, during which time it will continue to deceive many. And that's quite a mouthful, but, but that is the continual destiny of the papal system until it's destroyed by Jesus Christ. We'll look at the quotations that support this. Secondly, we're going to see that it's going to reassert itself as the mother church. That's why we have all of this tremendous flurry of activity between the papacy and the Orthodox Church, because there is a, a biblical basis behind this particular movement. Thirdly, we're going to see that the papacy itself is going to have a significant connection with the Russian power both before and after Armageddon. And fourthly, we're going to see that the papacy itself will dominate Europe. It will dominate Europe in a most unholy alliance that allows its papal influence to disseminate across the European theatre. It is an awful power as far as the scriptures are concerned. So let's look at our first point here. This, this, this luxurious, immoral, powerful, blasphemous system will continue to increase in power until it's destroyed. I'd like you to come to Revelation chapter 17. Uh, we've got a couple of quotations here. Uh, if you're taking notes, you might want to take them all down because we're only going to look at a couple of them in the time that we have available this afternoon. Revelation 17 is the first one we're going to look at. In Revelation chapter 17, the scriptures invite John to look at the final state of the judgment in verse 1 of the great whore that sits upon many waters. That's pretty blunt language. We don't like to talk about those kind of women. But this is the, this is the symbol that the scripture has selected to demonstrate the awfulness of this system, a whore that sits upon many waters. If you want the interpretation of the waters, the chapter gives us its own interpretation. Verse 15. The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. It is an international force. Many people, many waters. And the significance of this particular picture is, is that this is the final phase of the horse system. Because this system is going to go into perdition. In other words, it'll be destroyed. So, so whatever's in this chapter, brethren, sisters and, uh, and young people, is the final culmination of this system before it is destroyed. So let's just look a little closely at this particular power. A whore sitting upon many waters. Did you know that under Pope Leo XII, they happened to mint a coin? And the coin happened to show a woman holding a cup sitting across this particular platform here, which in the Latin was sedet super universum. She sits over the world. Now that's minted by the papacy itself. It is an astounding correlation to the picture which the apocalypse has of this final system. In verse 9 we're told that the 
seven hills upon which this particular uh, system actually stood are seven hills. And I'm sure most of us are aware from our studies in classical history that Rome was built on seven hills. The interpretation of verse 18 is also very clear. She represents a city. So, so, so we're left in no doubt as to what the symbol is represented. The chapter gives us the interpretation. It is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And there was only one city that reigned over the kings of the earth in the times of John, and that was Rome itself. In fact, once again, the Catholic Church produced, sorry, the, 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 the Roman Empire produced uh, another coin here. This was minted in 71 AD during the reign of Vespasian. And it shows a woman sitting upon seven hills. So, so even the Romans themselves recognised that their great city itself was indeed noted for a woman sitting upon seven hills. So there was no doubt in the minds of the early brethren and sisters of the first century as to who this great city represented. It was the city of Rome. And... These seven hills also had another dimension because we're told in verse 10 these seven hills represent seven kings or seven forms of government. Five are fallen, one exists at the moment, says John, another's not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is of the eighth, is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And what that really means is this that, that there were in the history of the development of Rome, different forms of government. The kings, the consulars, the dictators, the decemvira, which is ten men, the military tribunals, were the five that had fallen, those were in the past. Uh, the form of government that is, was in fact the imperial government. This, this was when the New Testament was written. A sixth would come, which would last a very short time, and this was the Gothic power. The Goths invaded Rome, and for a very short time, for 60 years, they dominated the capital. But then they disappeared. And then there is the final eighth head. And this eighth head is, we're going to see in our address this afternoon, a special, unusual combination of powers within the framework of the Roman Empire. So, this all points to Rome, particularly to Papal Rome. When the Catholic Church got hold of the Apocalypse, they tried to ban the book because it was very damning to them. And, in fact, they said, well, really, Revelation 17 is talking about pagan Rome. And they attempted to deflect all of this incendiary kind of language from their own system. But there are three reasons why this chapter refers to papal Rome. The first is this. The beast has ten horns. We're going to see what these ten horns represent. But they represent powers that came upon the European theatre way after paganism had disappeared. The second, the eighth head, that, that head which came at the end, didn't appear until AD 800, many, many years after the, the fall of pagan Rome. But here is the significant one. This system makes war with the Lamb. In other words, brethren and sisters, this chapter is speaking about the final, crucial, climatic power of a system that will be destroyed by the Lamb and those who follow him. And God willing, that will be us, people like us. Brethren and sisters who have been raised from the dead, having been put to death by this system, will be given the privilege of destroying it. And this system will show its true colours in all its awfulness when it fights against the Lord Jesus Christ when the Lord returns. It is the power that goes into perdition. This is the final picture of this papal system. And it is an awful picture to behold. We find in verse 4 that she's arrayed in purple and scarlet. And, and you think, well, that's, that's interesting. Now, just think about the power of this. You've probably worked for a corporation that every five years changes its corporate uniform. If you work for Qantas, they change every two years. 
Now, here's a system that's never changed its corporate attire for 2,000 years. And the Apocalypse knew that and understood that and identified it that it still has this purple and scarlet colour and it will continue to do so. Isn't that intriguing, the way the record is presenting the awfulness of this system? It's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. If ever you've been to the Vatican and seen the opulence of that place, that will continue. They cannot estimate the wealth of the Vatican. It is impossible to estimate. The Vatican Museum has priceless treasures. The Vatican itself has priceless treasures. You never could sell them on the market because it doesn't have a price. It is the epitome of wealth. And that wealth will continue until it's destroyed. The opulence of that. The current Pope, Pope Francis, has scaled down that opulence a little bit. He prefers an ordinary Ford car to drive in. But he's still got all that glitter behind him. This is a church that seeks money on every hand. And she's presented, says verse 4, as a woman who has in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. You know, we are all aware of the filthiness of her fornication, and yet she's still growing. 4,444 alleged incidents of child abuse across 93 Catholic Church authorities since 1980. And yet it is still popular, it is still growing, because she has deceived the nations. So help us God. That was the point made by that particular article. And fornication, Baron Sitters, in, in a biblical sense, is also representative of idolatry. And there is the Pope worshipping the Madonna and the grotesqueness of all of that mother of God religion, and that will grow and continue to grow. There's a black Madonna that John Paul I was very much enamoured with, and it will continue to be like that despite the filthiness of her fornication. Across her forehead, says verse 5, is this emblazoned word, mystery. You know, the great mysteries experiencing the Catholic faith. A whole book on the mysteries of the Catholic Church. This astounding situation here, this is the wafer. And what they do is, is they take the wafer and they put it in the monstrance, which is like a, a sun god symbol. And, and this monstrance that they put it into will miraculously convert it to the body of Jesus Christ. This is my body. That's, they literally interpret that. How does that happen? It's a great mystery. Now the Pope's got a problem. Because a lot of the parishioners have problems with gluten. And the Catholic Church said, well, I don't think Jesus Christ was gluten-free. <laughs> so they have the problem now of actually saying, well, you can't have gluten-free wafers. See, how silly is the system? But there's the mystery of that. I don't know how it happens, but it's a great mystery. That is, in fact, the astounding point of the religion. We don't understand. How, how can you bring people into your church if you don't understand? Well, the Catholic Church does it amazingly. In 1982, the Orthodox Roman Catholic Joint Commission published in Munich first official common document. So the Lutheran Church and the, uh, and the Roman Catholic Church got together and put a common document together. And the common document was called The Mystery of the Church and of the Eucharist in Light of the Mystery of the Holy Trinity. Now, imagine putting a book out saying, we don't know what we're talking about, but it's a bestseller. <laughs> Absolutely astounding. And that will continue as people are deceived by its power. It's a persecuting system. And it will continue in that vein of being anti-Bible, anti-Christadelphian, anti-anything that stands up against that system. It is drunk with the blood of the martyrs and saints. And those brethren and sisters who were butchered by this system will be raised again and vengeance will be God's. It's an awful system. In Revelation 18, verse 2, when Babylon the Great, which is this huge system, 
is finally removed from the earth. Uh, the record says that all nations are affected by the duplicity of this system. Now this just shows you the power of this church. Christadelphians don't get invited to talk to the United Nations, but the papacy does. Lutherans don't. Mormons don't, but the Pope does. September 2015, Pope Francis addresses the UN calling for the port of access to food, water, housing and religious freedom, as if it tolerated religious freedom, which it never does. Now, there's no other religious leader in the world gets to address the other nations, but this man does, because Revelation said all nations will be affected by it. When the system finally disappears finally is destroyed, the merchants of the earth, which are enriched through her luxury, mourn for the loss of this system. And the economist tried to estimate the income of the Catholic Church in 2010. And it, it, it said, look, we're not very successful, but we'll take a guess based upon the number of parishioners, their average collection, and we reckon that most likely the total income, we're not talking assets, we're just talking parishioners through their collections, probably around $200 billion a year. That is bigger than many corporations across the world. $200 billion. The wealth of that is astounding, and it will continue to grow, because this is the enemy that God has identified for us. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And there it is. Hugely influential, powerful. It has a population which spans 1.2 billion people across the world. That is astounding influence, and it will continue to grow. Let's look at our second point here. The second point we want to make is, is that the Catholic Church will continue to reassert its motherhood. It's, it's a mother church. And the quotation to support that are 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation 17. I'd like you to come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 initially. And the Apostle Paul had written to the Ecclesia at Thessalonica and had spoken in the first epistle about the fact that the Lord would soon return. And unfortunately that had been misunderstood by members of the Ecclesia. So he had to write a second epistle. And amongst this, the, the points he made in the second epistle was to, to correct their misunderstanding. And they thought the Lord would occur, come immediately. And that, that they thought that he would be here in a few years' time. And Paul had to say, no, no, that's not what I was saying. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, which is the day of Jesus Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the Greek word falling away is apostasia, an apostasy. So, so Paul is saying, look, the Lord can't come immediately because there will be a mystery of iniquity working, mystery of iniquity, which will eventually develop this massive system that has to develop before the Lord returns. There will come a falling away first, and, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God. He is supreme. He is above all in religion. He is the epic point of religion. And that's exactly what the papal church does today. It exalts itself, its own primacy, above all other churches. Now, why is this significant? Well, verse 18, then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This power will continue to grow and grow and grow and exalt itself above all that's called God, every other religion. It will continue to sit 
in the temple of God, saying, I am God, God's representative, the vicar of Christ. And this is a, an interesting shot. This is the shot of the throne of St. Peter. So we're talking about a throne and a king in a temple. And it just shows you the enormous, ornate sort of structure of this. This is a massive throne. And there the Pope actually sits and administers. And they call the Vatican the temple of God. He calls himself the representative of Jesus Christ. He is, in every respect, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So though he puts his thumbs up and says everything's okay, this system will be destroyed. Now, man of sin, son of perdition, is a little bit like the body of Christ. It, it's, it's representative of a multitude of people. And the whole system of the man of sin, son of perdition, has been a succession of popes right down through the ages. He may be the last one. Who knows? But that's the system. And despite the thumbs up, God will say it's thumbs down. There will be a massive change to this system. Now let's come back to Revelation 17. So, so 2 Thessalonians 2 says he exalts himself above all that's called God. Every other religion, he will take the primacy. And, and in fact, whenever you see photographs of the Pope administering Holy Communion to other religions, he's always in the centre distributing the communion to other churches. No one else gets centre stage. No one else is allowed to actually give out the Holy Communion. It's always the Pope. And that symbology is because he seeks the primacy above all. Now, I'm going to come to Revelation 17. In verse 5, upon this woman's forehead, this, this Roman system, was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, I just want you to ponder that expression. He's like a puppet master. Now, the record says he, or this system, is the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. Now, what I want to make in that verse is, it's, it's highly significant, brethren sisters, the church is out there, it doesn't matter how Christian they may seem, they are styled by the word of God, harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, now ju just absorb that piece of information, because we live in an age which is a very ecumenical age, an age that seeks to blur doctrinal issues. You don't need statement of faiths, you don't need doctrinal persuasion. And sadly, brothers and sisters, we can fall into the trap of saying, well, well, we don't need a statement of faith. We don't need to have a doctrinal perimeter around it. Well, we do. Now, now just, just think about God's description of Christianity. The Lutheran Church, Mormons, Pentecostals, Jehovah's Witnesses, harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's not my language, but is exceedingly blunt language from the Spirit of God. That's the enemy. Evangelicalism, ecumenicanism, all the philosophies that, that the, the Christian bookshops come out with, that's the enemy as far as God is concerned. And above all of that sits the mother, the mother church. It's a huge warning to us in these last days. The mother church. They even recognise that themselves... You know, this particular plaque here is in the Lateran Cathedral. This is, this is the Pope's own personal cathedral in Rome. And in the Council of Trent, which was the Counter-Reformation back in Europe, the Roman Church was described and affirmed as the mother and mistress of all churches. So she even defines herself as a mistress as well as a mother. And this plaque here, which has the papal insignia, the sacred Lateran, this is what the, the, uh, the, the Latin reads, mother and head of all churches of the city and the world is plastered on the Pope's own personal cathedral in Rome. That's their status. And that's why they are seeking to be above all. Now in 1054, things didn't go the way the papacy wanted. There's what's called the Great Schism. 
The Great Schism of 1054 split the western part of the Roman Empire from the eastern part, and this became Roman Catholic, and this became Orthodox. So you had Russian Orthodox, you had Greek Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, Hungarian Orthodox, and the Great Schism of 1054 split the world, religiously so. So this, 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 this is now challenging the primacy of the Catholic Church. Revelation 17, 2 Thessalonians 2 says that she will, in the end, before she's destroyed by Jesus Christ, will be above all. She will be the Mother Church. And so, in 1964, Patriarch Athen Agoras and Pope Paul VI mutually rescinded that great excommunication in 1054. The great schism was healed. Now, that's, that's intriguing because... That's not too long ago, 1964. It took nearly a thousand years to get that <coughs> excommunication rescinded, happening in our time. And so we see this tremendous surge of interest in the papacy realigning itself with Orthodox Christianity, wooing back the daughter churches. So here's Pope Francis having a peck on the cheek with Patriarch Bartholomew. <laughs> This is one of the most significant developments. Had to happen in Cuba, a neutral country, in which the Pope and the Patriarch Prince Cyril of the Russian Orthodox Church met and exchanged gifts. A huge symbol of the two religions coming together. Now the power of this is, is that when you add 800 million Orthodox Christians to 1.2 billion Catholics, you have 2 billion Christians under your control. That's power. That is power. And the Pope knows that. You have this reconnection to ecumenical dialogue and the ministry of Peter. Pope Francis greatly desires to bring all believers in Christ closer together to overcome the divisions of past centuries. Why? Because the Prophecy had told us it would have that primacy. So here we have the prayer service. Here he is in the middle. And we find that the Lutheran and Methodist churches are now brought back into the fold. Catholics and Lutherans sign a joint declaration accepting a common path. Let's, let's forget Martin Luther. Let's forget the doctrinal divisions. Let's just come back together and enjoy the common path. Even the Church of England, on the brink of unity. So here we have the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury attempting to join together. The sticking point, of course, is, is that the Church of England is reluctant to actually call this uh, particular individual head of all churches. Queen Elizabeth is the head of the, of the Church of England. So there's a sticking point, but it's all happening. And we find, in fact, that the Pope himself is extending himself to Muslims. Have you ever thought why in Ezekiel 38 we have Europe allied to Russia and we have Islamic countries like Iran also allied to Russia? How is it that the papacy and Russia can work with all of these people? Because you see, all of this common bonding together of Islam and Catholicism is part of the Pope's particular uh, representation. So here we have the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. The Pope said an attitude of openness in truth and love must prevail in dialogue with believers of non-Christian religions despite the various obstacles and difficulties, particularly fundamentalism on both sides. Now we as brethren and sisters in Christ would be classified as a fundamentalist religion. We believe the Bible is true, both Old and New Testament. We'd be classified as fundamentalism. Catholic Church does not promote fundamentalism. So here he is in the middle again, with all of these non-Christian people. I don't know whether this guy is smiling or grimacing, but, but he's there in the picture next to the Pope. So that's the biblical background why this interfaith dialogue is happening. Because the Catholic Church will be above all that's called God, and it will be the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That will continue to grow. Now, the other dimension, which Brother John alluded to in, in his address also, is this connection with Russia. It is a, a 
a very strong connection. And there are three key quotes which talk about this connection that the papacy has, both before and after Again, We're only going to look at one of them in Daniel chapter 8, so we have time for this afternoon. So let's turn to Daniel. Now in Daniel chapter 8, we have in verse 3 and 4, the picture of a ram. And once again, the chapter gives us the interpretation of the symbol. So the ram in verses 3 and 4 is explained for us in verse 20 to represent the Medo-Persian Empire. Not just the Medes, not just the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. So there we have the symbol explained. And Daniel 8 sees this ram, this Medo-Persian Empire, suddenly attacked by this goat, this he-goat, which with a huge pace of velocity hit the ram, destroyed the ram, and stood up proud in victory. And that particular he-goat with one single horn was the power that inflicted that defeat. So in verse 21 we have the interpretation. The rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horns between his eyes, the first king. So once again, the interpretation is very simple. And that explains the next phase of the kingdom of men. The first king was Alexander the Great. And through three decisive victories, took this massive empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. The horn was broken. Alexander died at the age of 33. And what happened was, was that in its place, four horns came up. You don't normally see a goat with four horns, but in the symbol, this is what's representing the record. These four horns, again, are explained in verse 22. So, so once again, the interpretation is quite clear. Once Alexander was eventually deceased... The empire went through a bit of a turmoil for a few years, and then eventually, when the dust settled, there were four generals who, in fact, took this particular Greek empire. They were not of his own power. They had no relationship to Alexander through, through, through birth, but they were his generals. And we find that history calls these the Diadochi. There were five after Alexander's death, and by the time they sorted it all out, after a few years, there were four. And these four horns represent the Greek Empire broken up. So we have the Ptolemies here, and we have the Seleucids over here, uh, we have Cassander over here, and Lysimachus here, Alexander's four generals. And then, an unusual development happened because the record says in verse 9 that out of one of those horns came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great. So, so now we have another development in this region, an offshoot, if you like, of one of those horns. And this particular horn is described as magnifying himself against, as it should be, the prince of the host. That's Jesus Christ. And this power took away the sanctuary. That's the temple. Uh, this, this is the power of Rome that crucified the prince of the host, Jesus Christ, and destroyed the temple in AD 70. In fact, this language of Daniel 8 is pulled out by Jesus Christ and placed into the Olivet Prophecy. It's really quite intriguing the way Jesus did that, because he understood precisely those details. Now, this is where it becomes interesting, because the interpretation again is starting to now to give us some substance to this little horn of the goat. Verse 23 gives us the interpretation that in the latter time of their kingdom, so as, as, the, as the four generals of Alexander the Great and their empire finally were overcome by the Roman power, when the transgressors have come to a fall, and that's talking about Jewish transgressions, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So here's the interpretation. That, that little horn of the goat represents a power, a king, a kingdom, which is described as a king of fierce countenance. Now, if you want to take a, a note of that, that actually comes from the book of Deuteronomy. 
And Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 to 52, use that expression to describe the Roman power. So we're in context. We are talking about the Roman power who is standing up, having absorbed all the Greek empires, if you like. And the record says that he will understand dark sentences, or rather says he's skillful in dissimulation. So deceit, trickery, dissimulation, two-facedness is part of their domestic and foreign policy. Now, that little horn of the goat was Rome. And as you can see there from the map, the Roman Empire took the Greek Empire, took the region of the Middle East. But we find in verse 25, through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. By peace shall destroy many. And here's the point I want to make. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. The Roman Empire was never broken by hand by the prince of princes. So therefore there must be a latter day fulfilment of this verse. So let's move on. The record says there in verse 25 of this Roman power that through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. So his policy, his, his intelligence, his, his prudence if you like, will cause craft to prosper. Now this word craft is an unusual word. The Hebrew word is murmur which means fraud or deceit. So he has a deceitful policy and he causes deceit to prosper. But this word deceit is used in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 6 of a deceit that robs people of their knowledge of God. It's a religious deceit. Now we have here on the left a man called Justinian and on the right a man called Phocas. As the Roman Empire developed and east and west split, the emperors in the east, particularly men like Justinian, were people who defended the western part of the Roman Empire. They supported the west and they propped up the papacy. Through his policy, he caused priestcraft to prosper. And so you have this Eastern Emperor here, Phocas, who in AD 610 proclaimed the Pope as the, the inheritor of Peter. The, the papacy is the mother of all churches, the primacy of the papacy. So, so all of these emperors in the East were, in fact, propping up the West itself. Now, the record says this. By peace... He shall destroy many. So, so the policy of this power, which occupies the Roman Empire, has a policy which will in fact destroy many. And that word peace there has this idea of prosperity, of quietness, of ease. So, so when things are peaceful, that's when it takes advantage. The Roman power has never stood up against Jesus Christ and been defeated by Jesus Christ. And that's why this verse is critical to understand because it's taking us from the history of Rome right through to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It can't stand up against Christ unless Christ is back. And therefore, brethren and sisters, this system which occupies the Roman Empire is a, a system that supports priestcraft. It supports the papacy. And in the end, it will be broken without hand. Now that is straight out of Daniel chapter 2. Remember that when the stone hits the image? The stone is cut out of the mountain without hands. So for this to occur, there must be a powerful Individual in possession of the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire, who supports the papacy and through his deceit and through his peace, 
He will destroy many nations. And that's why when Brother John described the rule of Putin as a rule of deceit, it's exactly what the scripture expects. Lies and deceit. We are seeing a biblical basis for the things that we're seeing around us. So the three P's. The Pope, Putin and Patriarch. For those who love alliteration. They are significant players. Why are we seeing Vladimir Putin supporting the church? As Brother John mentioned. Under communism, there was no interest in religion. In fact, they tried to flatten every church in, in, in Moscow. And now there's a resurgence because Daniel 8 expects an individual who will cause priestcraft to prosper. Actually, it's fascinating when you look at some of the, uh, of the photographs of Putin crossing himself, kissing icons, and bowing before shrines. It's an astounding thing, this, this master of, of political intrigue. We find, in fact, that they both need each other. We also find that this priestcraft is also developing itself in the West as well. Why the Pope loves Putin. Vatican ties help Russia portray itself as a bulwark of traditional values in contrast to secularised Europe. Putin himself has said that he is a defender of Christianity. That's why he's in Syria. Because he wants to defend the Christians in Syria. He will continue to do that. As we speak, there is a meeting now between Vladimir Putin and also the Pope's right-hand man. They're trying to negotiate a meeting between the papacy and the Russian Orthodox Church. And increasingly belligerent, Vladimir Putin is finding a new friend in a man of peace, Pope Francis. The Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, is scheduled to fly to Moscow, but well, he's there at the moment. And they're going to talk about trying to get the two churches together. <coughs> Excuse me. The latest news is, is that they've got on very, very well, and they're now building a foundation for the two to meet. Why is all this happening? Because we have a political system supporting a religious priestcraft system. Just as it did in the old days of the Roman Empire. Like Trump, Francis faces criticism for, from his base over his Russian policy. He is pro-Russia. Brother Thomas wrote in Exposition of Daniel two remarkable sections. Let me quote them. As the head of a confederacy of the adherents of the Greek and Latin churches... It will be his policy, Russia's policy, to cause their priesthoods to be respected as useful cooperators in the subjection of Europe to his will. In other words, Putin will use this religious two billion base to further his imperial ambitions. He needs them. And Brother Thomas knew that from Daniel chapter 8 and also Daniel 11. This ecclesiastical policy of the Constantinopolitan autocracy, that is Russia in Turkey, is enlarged upon in the description of it set forth in the 11th chapter, where it is more particularly regarded in its Catholic constitution, without taking into the account the division of the Babylonian superstition to Greek and Latin Catholic churches. Whatever may be the individual prejudices existing between individuals of the two schisms matters not. Their ecclesiastics, whose spiritual authority is death-stricken by infidelity, on the principle of self-preservation, will have to place themselves under the shadow of the autocrat. Now, that language is an exposition of Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, which we've explained this afternoon. He will cause priestcraft to prosper, and through his policy of deceit and peacefulness, he will destroy many. That's why Russia and the papacy, and the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Russian Orthodox Church will amalgamate in this massive confederacy. It's a holy war. Now the final point of the address this afternoon is to talk about the influence the papacy has in Europe itself. This is really the, the main theatre of papal influence. There are three main quotations. We're going to deal with a couple of those. Mainly Daniel 7... 
and Revelation 17. I'm going to assume some basic biblical prophetic understanding. In Daniel chapter 2, we had all the metals, and now in Daniel chapter 7, we have four beasts. And the metals directly correlating, directly identical to the beasts. We find, in fact, that not only are they identical, but, but, but they're, 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 there's a point of the prophecy that we need to understand. When we hold Bible lectures on Daniel chapter 2, I'm sure we go through all of the various metals and, and demonstrate, in fact, the greatness of God's power in giving all of these empires across the world. But there are two verses in Daniel chapter 2 that are critical to understand the real significance of Daniel chapter 2. The first is this, in verse 28. It is a prophecy of the latter days. So whilst it is a historical movement of the powers of the kingdom of men, in the end, brethren and sisters, it's a representation of what's going to happen in our time. Point number one. The second critical verse of Daniel chapter 2 is the word together in verse 35. In other words, this massive image is not just the sequence of Babylonian followed by Medo-Persian, followed by Greek, followed by Roman empires. It is the amalgamation of all of those territories in one massive dominion together in the latter days. That's the significance of Daniel chapter 2. Now in Daniel chapter 7, precisely the same interpretation is given. It's not just the movement through the beasts. The fact is, is that fourth beast in the end conquers every other beast. Same, same story, different symbology. We expect to see a power that arises, which will be Russia, which will put all those empires together in one single dominion, whether they're beasts or whether they're metals. The second point is this, that the picture is the same. The destruction of the image by the stone is precisely the same as the slaying of the fourth beast. Both end in perdition. This fourth beast was terrifying. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 7. It's not even named. It's just an animal. Ten horns with another horn coming up out of the middle of that. Frightening picture. In fact, Daniel lost sleep over this vision. Because this animal fought against the holy ones and destroyed them. The ten horns are described for us in verse 24 as ten kings that shall arise. And there's a picture of the Roman Empire that was broken up into ten barbarian countries. Now, that's interesting because, you see, every other empire had been replaced by another. But when it comes to the Roman Empire, it wasn't replaced by anything else. It just disintegrated. And those ten barbarian powers virtually form the current political situation of Europe, different countries. And as he was exploring that and trying to come to grips with that, all of a sudden, I considered and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So as the Roman Empire disintegrated into ten barbarian powers, many years later, after the ten had arisen, was another peculiar horn. It was peculiar because of its eyes and its mouth. It sees and it speaks. Why is this significant? Because whatever that power represents, verse 21 and verse 22 tell us <clears throat> that it will exist until it is destroyed by Jesus Christ. So whatever that power is, was more than just the representation of the Roman Empire. It was the development of something which will continue to exist until it's destroyed. So that's significant. It's an awful system, but there's some composite powers that we have to understand. Firstly, 
It's a military power. This is horn, and, and horns in the Bible are military powers. Secondly, it is a religious power because it speaks great words against the Most High. Thirdly, it's a persecuting power because it, it makes war with the saints. And lastly, it's a civil and legislative power because it can change times and seasons. So, so, so it's, it's a complicated power, isn't it? It, it? it has military power, it has religious power, it has civil power. And it speaks great things. You know, here's some of the great things it speaks. This is the infallibility of the Pope. When he speaks ex cathedra, should anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity to reject this definition of ours, let it be anathema. So whenever the Pope speaks ex cathedra, if you disagree, anathema. Great things. Now, what is this power? What is this little horn with eyes and mouth that is a military power, a religious power, and a civil power? Well, it's called in Scripture the Holy Roman Empire. It was the combination of an emperor and a pope. Charlemagne was the first, and Pope Leo III was the first pope. And together, they dominated Europe for almost a millennium. It was Napoleon that finally got rid of the Holy Roman Empire. But the point is, this system will reappear until it's destroyed by Jesus Christ. When Charlemagne, in fact, took Western Europe, he took Western part of Eastern Europe. That's why this whole region is significant to us. So what will we see? What do we expect to see? We expect to see the resurgence of a Western European power ruled by a central civil military authority, together with a dominant papacy in a similar arrangement to the Holy Roman Empire. That's why we are absolutely fascinated as brethren and sisters in Christ to see the linkages between the papacy and the European Union. So what do we find? Pope Francis receives Europe's most prestigious award, the Charlemagne Prize. The Charlemagne Prize is conferred annually by the German city of Aachen to those who, who have contributed the most to the unity of post-war Europe. The prize is usually given in the city, but the ceremony was transferred this year to the Vatican for the Pope's convenience. It's in the centre again, and, and this whole reflection of the Pope's interest in Europe is not by chance. It's because we will see the development of the Holy Roman Empire. So we find, look who's in the middle. EU leaders converge on Rome to rekindle a sense of unity. This was the meeting held just a few months ago of the 60th anniversary of the foundation of the European Union. And they're in the Vatican. The temple of God. And he's right there in the centre of that. Lutherans aren't there. Mormons aren't there. Church of England out there, he's there. EU risk dying needs new vigour and passion, says Pope Francis. The Pope has repeatedly criticised Europe over the past five years for its perceived lack of vision, drawing the ire of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel in 2014 when he described the EU as an elderly woman who is no longer fertile and vibrant. A woman. Look at the language there. This time he adopted a less hostile tone on Friday, but urged the continent not to close on in on itself and resurrect walls, a message aimed as much at the US President Donald Trump as its EU leaders on mass immigration. He is having a voice in European affairs. So, to conclude. He is the man of sin to be destroyed at Christ's coming, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He is the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, to be destroyed at Christ's coming. He is the harlot on the beast, to be destroyed at Christ's coming. And he is the god of guardian saints, the priestcraft that's supported by the Russian power, to be destroyed at Christ's coming. The picture is different symbols, but identical ending. Our final exhortation for us all, brethren and sisters, is taken from Revelation 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people, 
that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. We have nothing at all to do with that system, or its harlot daughters, or its abominations. Come out of her, my people. That is the enemy that God portrays in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. May it be, brothers and sisters, that we may have the wisdom to leave that system completely alone and with our Lord rooted out of the earth.